I've contemplated for a long time about the type of fashion that I would like to make. The exotic, garish, and conceptual clothing of Alexander McQueen, John Galliano, and Ray Kawakubo were what first drew me into the exciting world of fashion. But as my understanding of the medium, the industry, and myself grew, the detached nature of that type of clothing became more and more apparent as I became more interested in the real world and less the escapism of fashion. Not to say that certain designers such as McQueen didn't successfully portray both reality and fantasy, but his clothes still felt detached from the everyday person. The way I see it, I think it's more significant to try and change the perspective of the average close-minded person than to impress or appeal to the stranger individuals of society. I think that the weirdos have enough alcoves in fashion and beyond, with the help of the internet to escape at this point. But I think that the internet has had an opposing effect on the average person, creating a homogenized mass of consumers. So I've concluded that I want to make more typical commercial clothing with subtle provocations to make the average person think twice but not feel immediately turned off rather than preach to the converted. So how do you create typical clothes that challenges and changes the perspective of the typical person? And as with most of my videos, I'm mostly talking about menswear, but everything I says here could also apply to women's wear. As most of life's biggest questions, plenty of answers have been given. All we have to do is look back. This is going to sound uninformed at first, but um, one answer to the question goes by Yoji Yamamoto. Yes, the Yoji Yamamoto that has for so long been attached by the hip to a past lover of his. Ray Kawakubo. And their connection makes perfect sense. Both the designers came to Paris separately in 1981 to show a side of women's wear that was at odds with what was prized in Europe at the time. In an interview with Yamamoto in 1983, he recalled, when I started designing, I wanted to make men's clothes for women. The British fashion photographer Nick Knight recalled what first struck him about Yamamoto when they met in 1986. I felt he was so revolutionary because his clothes were about a woman's emotions, her intellect, and her thoughts, not about her shoulders, her bust, hips, bottom, or legs. Yoji's fashion is deeply poetic, and his were the first clothes that said a woman's beauty and her strength is her mind not our sexuality. This was new, and for me, extremely refreshing. And the same could more or less be said about Rei Kawakubo. But both artists have had lengthy enough careers to have been able to distinguish themselves from each other. And so they have. I think a good place to start to back up my statement regarding Yamamoto creating elevated commercial attire, in a positive way, by the way, not mocking that or saying that his clothes are bad, it's a good thing, is by observing how the Japanese designers differed in their design philosophies as they grew in their careers. A lot has been said over the decades about both brands. They've been contrasted as competitors and compared as allies. Both designers and brands are similar and different in many ways, but for the sake of brevity, the inextricable link between Yamamoto and Kawakubo started to sever in 1997, when the designers chose alternate routes to explore with their design. Kawakubo came out with her now infamous lumps and bumps collection, denoting a more conceptual way of thinking through the medium of fashion. Fashion, while Yoji stuck to challenging his own personal beliefs of fashion and would go on to release a streak of hit collections opening up to a more sensual side of femininity that he previously entirely rejected. While both artists have vast archives of avant-garde work, I find Kawakubo's more experimentally stimulating. However, I find Yamamoto's overall approach more diverse and therefore more engaging. Which brings me over to his side if it was a context. Not saying that it is, it kinda is though. <laughs> Moving into the 2000s, both designers felt an urgency to commercialize. So in 2002, Comme des Garçons Play unfortunately showed its eyes for the first time and has since become the most universally identifiable symbol of the Comme des Garçons label. How sad is that? I've always despised CDG Play's uninspired take on everyday basics, but I understand its purpose as a necessary evil to fund the rest of Comme des Garçons. After all, it was Yoji Yamamoto's label that had to be saved from bankruptcy in 2009, not Comme des Garçons. But the formation of CDG Play felt like the brand was commercializing solely for the sake of making money, which is disappointing coming from a brand with such a creative figurehead. I guess I just would have expected more. I much preferred Yamamoto's approach and motivation towards commercializing. In 2003, Yoji Yamamoto initiated a joint venture with Adidas called Y3, which has lived on ever since. From an interview regarding Y3, the partnership began when Yamamoto began to feel the limitations of his own area of fashion, and that his Paris collections were too far removed from the reality of how clothes were worn on the streets, a mentality it seems people are still catching up with. I became very confined, he says, so I made a phone call directly to Adidas. Where his own brand label has its roots in tailoring, Y3 has always been about creating something new, a new synergy between high fashion and high tech, a new fusion of sportswear with Yamamoto's own silhouettes. While CDG Play felt like the fashion equivalent of selling out, Yamamoto took a more holistic approach in trying to reach more people and introduce them to new ideas with Y3. With Y3, I think it's fair to say that those interested in Y3 have more of a chance of being interested in Yoji Yamamoto, the brand, than those interested in CDG Play being interested in the rest of what Comme des Garçons has to offer. Looking to both brands today, it's my opinion that Rei Kawakubo has somewhat stagnated with her output. Although I think that I understand her goals, I made a whole video about it if you want to hear more, I find myself revisiting Yoji's collections each season and feeling refreshed with what I see, in contrast to 
Kawakubo's Comedy Garçon. Not all of Comedy Garçon, by the way. Junior Watanabe has been going crazy these last few seasons. Do not sleep on him if you have. After revisiting a myriad of Yoji's past collections, it's been super nice to watch his steady, constant growth to the clothing that he releases today, which I can't say is the exact same or close to what he was releasing 10, 20, 30 years ago. The guy has kept growing and changing up what he does. It's honestly impressive. Each collection is definitely still as specially crafted as they have been since the start. He's never faltered from his morals or philosophy regarding fashion. From the beginning, Yamamoto demonstrated a drive to create in his own manner for people that thought differently, that weren't entirely jaded with the world around them, only mostly jaded. When I started designing clothes 12 years ago, I knew there were two ways. The first is to work with formal classical shapes. The other way is to be very casual. That's what I decided on but I wanted a new kind of casual sportswear that could have the same status as formal clothing. His women's wear was radical for its time, and today it has its place as its own genre and fashion that he helped to pioneer. But his menswear didn't start with the same trailblazing nature. Because of the limitations of menswear that still ring true to a lesser extent today. If you go back and look at Yamamoto's older menswear collections, they're not as outwardly radical as his women's, but they still contain distinct elements of a unique identity tying them to Yamamoto. While re-familiarizing myself with his work, I was reminded of the Japanese aesthetic wabi-sabi, which I think defines his overall design philosophy. It's heavily present in Yamamoto's clothing and an element that is common among many brands that I adore today, such as Kiko Kostadanov or John Alexander Skelton. So I took some time to familiarize myself with the concept because I've heard about it, I know a bit about it, but I don't have an entire picture. So I read this book by Leonard Corin, Wabi Sabi, for artists, designers, poets, and philosophers. Possibly the most concise manual and metaphysical description that you'll find regarding wabi-sabi. Yamamoto has spoken about the concept before in relation to his clothing. I have no desire to make the perfect garment. If one seeks perfection, one should enter the world of haute couture. The real thrill lies rather pursuing the art of wabi-sabi to attempt to grab the tale of a slippery living that brings a serene melancholy. Yamamoto's clothing also evokes another Japanese concept, ma, which he explains, I like to leave a notion of blank space, what we call ma in Japanese. I think it is the space that gives my clothes the zen feeling. The notion of wabi-sabi and in turn ma is hard to pin down, but I'll try my best to talk about wabi-sabi and specifically about how I find it to apply to Yamamoto's clothing. Stereotypical ideas of the aesthetic describe it as rough and rustic, utilizing humble natural materials that emphasize imperfection, which isn't inaccurate, but leaves out so much nuance that really makes wabi-sabi such a meaningful idea to me. Wabi-sabi involves a certain appreciation of the current moment. All art lends itself to this wabi-sabi principle. Only the owner of a garment or painting or cup truly gets to appreciate all the little details about it. An outsider observing a garment in an everyday setting views it as the sum of its parts, rather than appreciating the embellishments and small shapes with which create the final product. At first, Yoji's clothing may appear overly drapey and formless, but there are so many intricacies required in order to create such delicate work. Everyone who loves clothing knows the difference between witnessing it in real life versus through a screen. And in that moment of experiencing it and touching it and seeing all the special details about it is when you feel wabi-sabi. Greatness exists in the inconspicuous and overlooked details that only stand out to the eye of certain individuals. And Yamamoto's clothing is full of inconspicuous details. I remember watching a video from Bliss Foster where he's puzzled by the enigmatic nature of Yamamoto's clothing, but I think an answer can be found in the foundations of Wabi Sabi, which he never really brought up. Wabi Sabi is comfortable with ambiguity and contradiction, in contrast to an aesthetic like modernism which is intolerant of such principles. Is there a reason as to why the grain of a bark of a tree goes in a certain direction. Sometimes the purpose of a feature is merely the result of the environment, the feature it's connected to, or what it has been exposed to in its lifetime. The flow and connection of Yamamoto's garments feature semi-senseless but meaningful connections. As contradictory as that might sound, it makes sense if you just look at the clothing. This is why it can be difficult for people to style his clothing outside of the runway. He's acknowledged this fact. Japanese clothing can just end up looking like a heap off the runway. If you look back to the quote where he was talking about combining sportswear with casual wear, he goes on to talk about his material choices. So I use fabrics that are heavy duty, like army fabrics, or just look heavy duty to give the kimono shape a new energy. We can see how Yamamoto utilizes rugged foundational fabrics to make up most of his clothing, even the formal pieces. He's always been interested in the overlap of formal and casual clothing, and so uses less precious materials to combine elements of casual clothing into formal clothing. Y3 is kind of a combination of that. And these less precious materials welcome more damage and wear, which in turn creates texture and character. Wabi Sabi welcomes degradation and attrition as it comes, because in Wabi Sabi there is no perfection, no end goal or final product. Everything according to Wabi Sabi is either devolving towards or evolving from nothingness. This is why I appreciate aged clothes, because every mark has had a natural means of getting there to make up the final garment. Think about this, when is the most valuable moment of an item to you? 
personally. The moment that you first acquire it and it's brand new or the last moment you have it before you never see it again, such as before you have to throw it away because you can't wear it anymore or if you just happen to lose it. I think that both experiences are the most profound times because those are the moments that it came into and left your possession from nothingness, regardless of the state that it's in. From analyzing Yamamoto's clothing and coming to this connection, as I said before, I spotted wabi-sabi elements of Yamamoto in many contemporary brands that I like. John Alexander Skelton embraces a more Western fashion approach with wabi-sabi heavily imbued into the final look of his clothing. Kiko Kostadinov displays similar elements with his fabric choice and decision of starting from scratch each season. I've always preferred subtle changes on relatively basic garments because there's really so much more you can do to a garment to make it more personal than having to make it an entirely avant-garde piece that has never been seen before. While Yamamoto has many of these pieces in his archive, which have their place for sure, I think it's his more wearable clothing that stand stronger. Throughout his lengthy career, he has done everything because he lets his mind wander and abuse everything with this wabi-sabi spirit that makes clothing timeless and ties it all together because it's a timeless aesthetic that can be interpreted in many ways. I could go on, but I think I've said what I've wanted about his clothes. I interpret Yamamoto's clothing as a very honest expression of wabi-sabi. He was one of the first to look for a deeper philosophy in clothing than surface level expression. He creates intimate personal experiences and I encourage you to find them in your own life with the little things that you come across. Back to the initial question of the video, just to answer it in case I haven't been clear. How do you create typical clothes that challenges and changes the perspective of the typical person in the way that Yoji Yamamoto does? With small details that a person may not be able to digest all at once, with fabrics that wear down over time to create a unique surface profile, with silhouettes that require a closer inspection to get a clear image of, with clothing that takes time to understand and connect with. I'm sure everyone has certain items that mean so much more to them than to others. And as that item rips and tears, that item only grows in value to you as it loses value to the rest of the world. But Wabi Sabi isn't about the rest of the world. It's only about you. And given humans are so self-centered, this selfish notion should do well in appealing to a lot of people. I can't end this video without touching on Yoji Yamamoto today. GQ released this puff piece on Yamamoto a few months ago titled, Can Yoji Yamamoto Save Fashion From Itself? Whatever that means. The article is a stark reminder about how he's the last of his kind. He expressed, I need competitors and year by year I'm losing my competitors. They're disappearing because of age. Since I lost Mr. Kenzo, Mr. Issei, I feel very alone. This lonesome feeling you cannot imagine, I feel so isolated. Although I am excited for the future in regards to fashion, I wanted to talk about Yoji Yamamoto to look back and show my appreciation before it's too late. What Yamamoto has always stood for is a genuine explorative perspective that will be harder to rediscover on such a grand scale as he did. Not only did he create his own aesthetic, but introduce a new philosophical perspective into clothing design, which is harder to do as time goes on and new philosophical perspectives aren't invented. In the GQ article, he went on to talk about the trends of today. Casual fashion became like garbage in the world. There are so many cheap wasting fashions. Young people look so ugly. Don't copy your friend. Don't be one of a group. Be yourself. Stay a little bit monotone. Walk on our side of the street. Don't walk the mainstream of fashion. You'll be polluted by trends. I think if more people listen to the masters who came from humble and authentic beginnings, it would make a lot more people a lot more happier. And as a collective, fashion would reach goals that most people want. But what can you do, Pharrell and Louis Vuitton? It's so interesting. Interesting. Thanks for watching. Uh, I have a full article coming out in the next few days all about Wabi Sabi if you want to hear more about my take on it. Obviously, I just try to connect it to Yoji, but I would love to talk about it some more. It'll appear on my website in a few days. Yeah, see you soon. Bye. I don't have my cactus, so I'll have to kiss with this plant pot. Too sensual, too much. Sorry.